expression of something wonderful and life-changing that has taken place on the inside. Because when someone's baptized, it's a simple matter of going down into the water and coming back up. But that simple imagery signifies something profound that has taken place inside their heart. Having received and believed the gospel, they have died, forfeited their old way of life, and they have identified themselves with Jesus' way of life, his new and everlasting life. And so they're raised to walk in the newness of that life. And so that's what uh, baptism signifies, and we're about to celebrate that together. This is uh, uh, significant in another way today because we've got the real privilege of uh, baptizing a husband and wife together. Uh, besides marrying a couple of folks, a preacher's great privilege is also baptizing a husband and wife as well. So at this time, I'm going to invite my friend Heath Matthews to uh, join me down here in the water. Many, if not all of you, have uh, made acquaintances with uh, Heath and his wife, Kate, and their beautiful little girl, Riley, recently when they uh, joined our church. And uh, Heath was sharing with me uh, his, his testimony of faith and uh, of walking with the Lord. But he also said, you know, I haven't followed through with, uh, with the obedience through baptism yet. And so I said, well, well, come on down into the waters and we'll baptize you and we'll let you put your faith on display in front of the whole church. So, uh, Heath, I'm just going to ask you one question. Is Jesus your Savior and Lord? Awesome. Well, because of your confession of faith and because of the command that our Lord has given us to baptize Jesus, it's now my privilege to baptize you. And I do so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. We are died with Christ and raised to walk in the newness of life. Please bow with us as we pray this morning. Our Father, Lord, we're so grateful that you are here with us today. And Father, Lord, we, we're thankful for the baptism that took part this morning, Father. Father, you're so faithful to us, Father, Lord. I pray that uh, in this service, your name will be honored and glorified, Father, Lord, for the, through the music, through the preaching. And Father, Lord, we, we're just so thankful for uh, the opportunity to be in your house again this morning. I pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Well, good morning. Welcome to worship this morning, and we've got a few announcements we need to, uh, uh, obviously I'm not Jason Odom, that was Jason Odom, uh, for those who, who did not know that. Um, we've got a few announcements for you. First and foremost, I'm sure for those of you who walked through the hallways over there, you were smelling the delicious food that is in the, uh, uh, the great room over there. We are having a barbecue fundraiser dinner today for the uh, mission trip. Plates are $8. Uh, and any additional donations are welcome as well, and all proceeds will go for that mission trip. And uh, speaking of the mission trip, uh, the, it's the mission trip, the, the student life camp at Covenant College, which we've talked about before. It's going to be uh, leaving on June the 7th and returning on June the 11th, and the cost is $359. Deposits are due today, and uh, so uh, for those who need to sign up, today is the last day to do that. Um, the National Day of Prayer is coming up next Thursday, May 3rd. There'll be a breakfast here at the church at 7 a.m., so that's coming up as well. And Vacation Bible School planning is uh, continuing, and uh, we're still looking for volunteers for that. Uh, Vacation Bible School is going to be Sunday, uh, June 24th through Friday, June the 28th, from 5.30 until 8 o'clock nightly. It will be a family night, June 29th at 5.30 uh, p.m. So please see uh, Sandy Vest, Amanda Loveless, or Kim Lane. Uh, if you want to be a part of that. And there's going to be in-house training as well for Vacation Bible School, so stay tuned for uh, the date for that. Does anybody else have any announcements? I know that uh, Holly Smith has something she'd like to uh, bring to us from Celebrate Recovery, so Holly. Well, hey, my name is Holly, and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I've overcome fears and insecurities. And, but I still struggle with grief and a whole lot of other host of life struggles and issues. And Celebrate Recovery has been meeting in our uh, great room on Monday nights for over three years now. <clears throat> and I'm humbled that I have the opportunity to walk alongside one of my sisters in Christ on her journey to healing and being set free from her hurts, habits, and hang-ups. We as a body of Christ today have the opportunity to join forces with her in making a difference in this community. I hope you will support her in a service project that she is passionate about and will share with you today. Mary Davis, will you come share with us? Good morning, my name is Mary Davis. I was addicted to meth for 16 years with hard work, determination, and help from Celebrate Recovery Family. I've been clean for three years. My meth use has caused me illegal problems. I was placed in a program called the Mental Health Court. I'm about to graduate my program and was asked to do a phase up project. I'm supposed to do a service project, something in the community that I'm passionate about. I chose to collect food for the local food pantry. With the help of Holly Smith, we have decided to try to help the Polk Baptist Family Food Pantry. There are so many people struggling to feed their families and I, I want to make a difference. I'm grateful for everyone willing to help this, make this happen. If you would like to help donate, any non-perishable food items, I have placed a donation box outside the great room and we'll be collecting food from June the 1st. Thank you. Amen. And uh, you'll see any other announcements uh, that may be in the bulletin. I, uh, cel the Celebrate Recovery Times are in there as well. Um, uh, one thing I didn't mention the uh, 2018 Graduate uh, Recognition Day will be on Sunday, May 20th, uh, so uh, please see Jason if you know of someone in the church who is graduating that we may not be aware of already. Um, and uh, the Annie Armstrong Easter offering is, uh, the goal for 2018 is $3,600 thus far. We've got uh, just over $3,000, so let's keep that coming. And uh, I think that's all the announcements. Does anybody else have anything? Well, let's uh, continue our worship together as we uh, greet one another, and then we'll sing our first hymn. So stand up and uh, shake somebody's hand and tell them good morning and that you love them.
right, if you'll get your handles, we'll turn to number 103, All Hail King Jesus. And then we'll sing 104, I'll Worship the King. Number 103, All Hail King Jesus. Let's turn our Bibles to our Old Testament reading found in 1 Kings 3, 5 through 12. That night the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, and God said, What do you want? Ask, and I'll give it to you. Solomon replied, You showed great and faithful love to your servant, my father David, because he was honest and true and faithful to you, and you have continued to show his great and faithful love to him today by giving him a son to sit on his throne. Now, O Lord my God, you have made me king and said my father David, but I'm like a little child who doesn't know his way around, and here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation so great and numerous they cannot be counted. Give me an understanding heart so I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong, for who by himself is able to govern his own great people of yours? The Lord was so pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. So God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice, not asked for a long life or wealth and death of your enemies, I will give you what you have asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one else has or ever will have. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Please stand as we sing hymn number 210, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. Number 210, we'll sing all four verses. this day. Thank you for uh, all the blessings that you've bestowed upon us, even those that we take for granted. <clears throat> Lord, may we cheerfully give a part of what you've given us. Bless that offering as it may benefit your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
If you have a Bible, I invite you to take your Bible and turn in your Bible to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. Today we're reading verses 44 through 46. Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 46. And uh, once you found your place there in sacred scripture, I invite you to follow along as I read it aloud. Uh, Let's give attention together now to the word of the Lord. Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Part of the fun of traveling, in my limited experience, is wrangling with souvenir vendors. They state their price for a certain item. I counter-offer. And back and forth we go. It sounds tense, but it's not. Uh, More than anything, it's like a game. I get a kick out of trying to get a good deal. There was this one time, though, when I got kicked out, um, as in uh, kicked out of the souvenir shop, um, I walked in uh, wanting to buy a a t-shirt or or something hand-carved. The shopkeeper saw my interest. He engaged me in conversation, and then he stated his selling price. I told him how much I was willing to pay. The next thing I know, I'm being pushed out of his shop. Um, There's no counter to my offer. All he says is, get out. Get out now. He's mad. Like, legitimately mad. I'm so confused. All I can say is, what do you mean? (laughs) No deal, he says. You offer a price that low, you can go on and get out now. I lowballed a souvenir vendor so badly, he refused to sell me a souvenir. That's bad, (laughs) y'all. Here's something that's really regrettable lowballing the kingdom of heaven. Assigning it a value much less than what it's really worth is infinitely more troubling and tragic. Like with everything in life, from our family to our college football fandom, from our health to our wealth, from the sports we play to the social calendar we keep, we have all assigned a value to God's reign and rule In our lives, somewhere on the spectrum of what means the most to us, there we'll find our devotion to God and His kingdom and the good news thereof. That's where the tragedy lies for so many, in valuing God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, less than what it really deserves. Where does God's kingdom deserve to rate? What value does it truly hold for our lives? Jesus once said, seek, not second, not third, seek first the kingdom of heaven. Now, more creatively than before, but with no less clarity, Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven, God's reign and rule, is MVP, the most valuable possession a person can have. According to our text for this morning, Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 46. God offers a matchless treasure 
So we must make God's kingdom most important. Jesus is giving his third major discourse in Matthew's gospel. Um, In this one, he's talking about, quote, the kingdom of heaven. This is an expression for God's right to reign and rule. Jesus teaches about the kingdom here through parables. A parable, remember, is a short story that teaches a spiritual lesson. It's a creative way to teach, but Jesus is speaking in parables for a more profound reason, to distinguish believers from non-believers. Believers Believers will hear the parables and grow in their belief, while non-believers will hear and realize their need to believe. In the first parable in chapter 13, Jesus uses a farmer scattering seeds in various soils to explain the range of responses when people hear about God's kingdom. In the second parable, Jesus uses a field of wheat and weeds uh, to explain uh, believers' current coexistence with non-believers. In the third parable, Jesus uses a mustard seed to explain the great growth of God's reign and rule in this world. In the fourth parable, Jesus uses some yeast to explain, similarly, its extensive reach. Here now, in verse 44, Jesus tells a fifth parable. Like he's done before, Jesus begins, The kingdom of heaven is like... This time he compares God's reign and rule to, quote, treasure. Jesus doesn't specify what kind of treasure. He simply means to invoke something of great value. This treasure, says Jesus, is, quote, hidden in a field. At some point, though, someone finds it. Maybe he stumbles upon it. Maybe someone gives him a map to it. (gasps) A treasure map. The point is, the man discovers the treasure. What is hidden to so many, he uncovers. No sooner does he uncover it than the man covers it back up. He puts the treasure back in the hole and replaces it with dirt. The reason, says Jesus, is that he does not own the field in which he finds it. Not yet. So he goes and buys the field. Now he owns the treasure hidden within. The field is no modest purchase. It's expensive, at least for this guy. Still, he wants the treasure it contains so much that he, quote, sells all he has to raise the funds to buy the field. As the word joy indicates, to the man himself, it is no real hardship to sell all his possessions like this. The way he sees and believes, the treasure he's gaining is worth way more than anything he's giving up. It doesn't just hold great value for him, it holds the greatest value for him. Okay, hold that thought as Jesus goes to the next parable. Again, says Jesus in verse 45, the kingdom of heaven is like the following scenario. This time, Jesus imagines a merchant. This merchant, says Jesus, specializes in, quote, fine pearls. Like today, pearls were highly valued in the ancient world. Like today, wearing pearls was a way of showing off one's wealth. This merchant, then, does high-end business. By worldly standards, he himself is well off. One day, says verse 46, while searching for yet more pearls, the merchant makes an exceptional find. As Jesus puts it, he comes across, quote, one pearl of great value. The guy deals in pearls for a living, so there must truly be something special about this one to stand out from the crowd like it does. Indeed, this pearl is so stunning that the merchant goes to stunning lengths to get it. Does this ring a bell? He, quote, went and sold all that he had and bought it. All his stuff, including all the other pearls he owns. The merchant sells everything so he can have this one magnificent pearl. 
Jesus makes no mention here of the merchant's joy in the transaction. But if we want to see it, the signs are there. His story is just like the treasure finder before him. Surely, so is his joy. These two parables, the parables of the the treasure and the pearl, look so much alike because they're saying the same thing. The kingdom of heaven is worth more than anything, more than everything. Moreover, since the kingdom is an expression for God's reign and rule, the point of these parables is that there is nothing greater, nothing better than living under God's reign and rule. God's reign and rule is so great, in fact, it's worth going all in. Both the treasure finder and the merchant signify this by selling all their possessions to acquire their respective prizes. Total abandonment of one's material possessions is not necessarily what Jesus is teaching here. What he's teaching is total commitment based on the ineffable value of God's kingdom. Total commitment, as Jesus' disciples can already attest, entails sacrifice. The treasure and the pearl are there for the taking. But to lay hold of them, the treasure finder and the merchant must let go of things they once held dear. Not all sacrifice is equal. Some are asked to give more than others. But all sacrifice speaks to the incomparable value of God's kingdom. The joy, though, the joy of living under God's reign and rule makes any sacrifice, whatever the actual terms, totally worth it. Where does it read uh, that the treasure finder laments the loss of all that he has? It doesn't. How sad was the merchant after trading all his pearls for that one? He wasn't. The silence from Scripture speaks volumes. There is nothing better than valuing God's kingdom above all else. It is good to go all in with God. Just last month, um, the following news article caught my attention. Um, It starts like this. A mysterious 19th century photograph bought on eBay for just $10 could be worth $2 million after experts identified it as a legitimate portrait of the infamous outlaw Jesse James. Did anybody else see this? Um, Apparently, a guy named Justin Whiting, who lives in England, uh, was browsing eBay in the last year when this old photo caught his attention. On a whim, he bought it, and then he asked some forensic experts to check it out. Sure enough, it's an original print of the notorious bank and train robber Jesse James taken when he was 14 years old. Surprising stories like this come across the news every now and then. Um, In 2006, for instance, a Tennessee man found a 200-year-old copy of the Declaration of Independence at a Nashville thrift store. In 2007, a New York woman found a 1,000-year-old Chinese ceramic bowl, which later sold for $2.2 million at a garage sale. In 2011, a North Carolina man at a flea market found another photo of another notorious American outlaw, Billy the Kid. Some of these folks didn't know at first what they had. But a lot of them, like Justin Whiting with the Jesse James photo, realized right away they had a real treasure on their hands. Like the treasure finder and the merchant in Jesus' parables then, they bought it up quick, fast, and in a hurry. What they had found was so great, they didn't want to go without it any longer. Most folks got a deal, no doubt, because the seller uh, didn't realize it at the time what was being sold. The point, however, is that the buyers paid whatever they had to pay to have it. That's how much they wanted it. It would have been worth it for them to buy out the whole yard sale 
or the whole thrift store for that matter, maybe even the very retail space the store occupied just to lay hold of the precious prize within. For most of them, if not all of them, what they had found was worth as much as or more than the rest of their material possessions combined. It was their treasure. The kingdom of heaven is a treasure. It's not a treasure among treasures, uh, like a sterling candelabra in a vast vault. It's not one mint baseball card in a box full of them. It's not just another masterpiece in a great art gallery. No, the kingdom is the treasure of treasures. The kingdom of heaven is matchless. It's peerless. It's priceless. It is so great a thing that it sets the standard for whatever else we might dare to call great. It stands so far up the value scale that everything else that can be had and loved in life, including so much of what we strain and stress ourselves over, needs to buy some Bushnell binoculars just to see it. It's that far ahead in terms of how much it's worth. The kingdom of heaven stands absolutely alone. I wonder if the treasure finder and the merchant, besides being excited, were also embarrassed. Suddenly, everything else they had valued so dearly for so long was now worth so much less, or even worthless. The treasure finder thought he knew what treasure was. The merchant no longer wants his precious collection of pearls. They see things different now. They're singing a different tune. All I once held dear, built my life upon. All this world reveres and wars to own. All I once thought gain, I have counted loss. Spent and worthless now compared to this. Gaining God's kingdom is a game changer. If we know its real worth, we're obliged to order everything else around and behind it. The kingdom, because of what the king has done for us, is life. Both the reason for living and the goal of living. Rather than valuing the kingdom relative to other interests in life, we value everything else relative to the kingdom. The kingdom gets its significance from nothing else. Everything else gets its significance from the kingdom. The kingdom, remember, is a joyful discovery. That being so, any loss for the sake of living under God's reign and rule is ultimately a gain. We believers possess and are possessed by the greatest thing in this world and the next. How then, if we say that God's kingdom is more precious to us than anything, can we ever begrudge God for calling us to center our lives on Him and follow him. God's kingdom is not a drag. It's a joy. Whatever God asks of us then. As a condition of coming into possession of his kingdom. He ultimately intends to increase our joy. Before my wife and I had kids. I was told. That having kids. Would make me think about what's most important in life. And then we had kids, and it came true. I found myself, and I still find myself, musing more seriously than ever about values. I need to know what's most important in life so that I, together with my wife, can pass those values down to our son and daughter. As a father of two young children... James is three, Lucy is one. I read this text, the parables of the treasure and the pearl, and this is one of the places my mind went. My thoughts turned to my kids, uh, my, my beautiful, uh, growing, impressionable kids, including the life God has laid out for them and the, the world they'll be 
living in? If I'm going to do right by James and Lucy, I must tell them what this text tells me. They'll never find or possess anything greater than God's kingdom. But I can do more than tell them. I can establish a home and a family ethic that honors God in all things. As for me and my house, the way we order our house will reflect God's kingdom as our greatest value. My kids won't be in sync with the material world, and that's okay. They'll be far richer, for they will know the surpassing greatness of God's kingdom instead. They'll know the greatness of God's kingdom also because they're growing up in church. Our kids are not in church because their dad is a pastor. They're in church because a church is a kingdom-created, kingdom-centered, kingdom-powered community of faith. A, a, A church is where the kingdom is proclaimed and personified. In a church, our kids will learn as they see God's kingdom in action that God's kingdom is worth having more than anything else. A church, remember, is not a building that has people inside, but a people who have the Holy Spirit inside their hearts. That being so, when I say that the younger generations amongst us will see God's kingdom through the church, I'm talking about us. We, the people, you and I, will be the ones to show them that there is nothing better than being part of God's kingdom. That nothing compares to this. Uh, As I said, a a church is uh, not primarily about the campus. Uh, See, we are just as much a church when we dismiss as we are when we congregate. What I'm driving at then is this. For as much as we say in here that God's kingdom is paramount, and for all the programs that we put on to make that point, we've still got to show it out there in the world so that our rising generations, not to mention the rest of our brothers and sisters, will know that it is more than high and mighty talk. It is total truth. Now some folks think... Uh, that they're supposed to be doing everything that their church is doing and quit every outside commitment. This is false. On the one hand, if we say that God's kingdom is paramount, then we're going to join in the life of our local kingdom-created, kingdom-centered, kingdom-powered community of faith. We're going to search out a special area of service by which we, with fellow believers, can show the world that God's kingdom is the greatest thing there ever was, is, and will be. Yeah. At the same time, as a church on mission in the world... We should be part of good things in the world. It's good to join clubs and and teams. Let's be dedicated friends and neighbors. Our only concern should be if it becomes more precious to us than God's kingdom. At which point we must, at the very least, dial it back. After all, we're out in the world to show the world, even while we enjoy all sorts of interest with the world, that nothing ever compares to God's kingdom. God wants us to value His kingdom above all else. Meanwhile, all sorts of pastimes and possessions vie for the same sacred spot in our hearts. As those infected and influenced by sin, we're blinded to the kingdom's surpassing worth. Valuing uh, God's kingdom as it should be valued then is impossible so long as we're adding things up with a faulty, sin-sick, rebellious calculator. So God fixes us. Out of His own grace, God comes to us and makes us new. He replaces 
our old heart with a new heart, which turns our old will into a new will and our old mind into a new mind. And just like that, we can see what God wants us to see and desire what God wants us to desire and choose what God wants us to choose, that His kingdom, life under His reign and rule, is right and good and, when compared to whatever else is out there, best. This is how we're able to obey what God, through his word, is saying to us today. God makes us able. If this sounds like good news, it's about to get even better. See, the very length God goes to help us value his kingdom more than anything else epitomize why we ought to value his kingdom more than anything else. Consider that the Son of God, Jesus, came from heaven into this messy world to do life with us as one of us. Consider that Jesus gave his life, which lacked any rebellion against God, to atone for the full measure of our own awful rebelliousness. Consider that Jesus returned from death to live a new and everlasting life, to show the world that his sacrifice had finally and fully paid our sin debt. Consider that the Holy Spirit came into the world to bring that same triumphant life to everyone who believes and consider that Jesus has promised that he's coming back one day to bring us believers into his coming kingdom where we will see better than ever and forever why it was good and right and best to value God's kingdom above all else. This is why all else under the sun pitifully pales in comparison to God's kingdom. The king of the kingdom, he alone and entirely of his great grace, has wiped away our sins and given us new life. God offers a matchless treasure. So we must make God's kingdom most important. Let's pray together. God, <clears throat> please help us to order our lives in a way that values your kingdom above all else. Whatever we must pick up or put down, give us the wisdom and the will and the power to do it. This we pray in your name, Father, Son, and Spirit. You are one God now and forever. Amen. So this is the time where we begin to respond to our experience in worship, to the time we've spent with God and what we've heard from His Word. So in a moment, you're invited, as the Spirit would lead you, to respond. If that's to respond to the gospel, would you please come forward in just a moment and meet me up front. If this is your day to join with our church in membership and partnering and proclaiming the gospel, please uh, come and meet me in just a moment. If it's time for you to be baptized, if you'd like to pray together, I'd be right here and I'd be glad to, uh, to, to pray with you for a moment. But with the Holy Spirit's help, uh, let's begin to uh, respond uh, according to his leading. We're going to sing and we're going to respond now.